So we're, like I said, we're going to be walking through uh, what this, um, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And so I don't know if you've ever had a, a bad dream. And maybe you know of a, a bad dream. Maybe it's something that you've, it's repeated in your mind or something that you've, you've dealt with according to your life. I had this dream that, that, uh, that as the worship team is, is on the fourth song and that my iPad sermon won't load. And I look to my wife and she just shrugs her shoulder and, and like she's like, I can't help you. And, and so then I'm like getting ready to walk up here without anything to share. That's a bad dream. So um, that is that's that's one. Maybe maybe uh, maybe you've walked up in that cold sweat. Maybe you have a, a certain dream that a bad dream that comes to mind for you as well. But often dreams are not like that, and and they're often a, a result of weariness. And um, but they're not divine relation. Uh, they're not divine revelation. I hope. Right. <laughs> I hope that doesn't come true. But this morning, we're going to be looking at all of chapter 2. Yes, all 49 verses of chapter 2. As we look at, there's two just key words that deal with what takes place in chapter 2. It's the dealing of the powerful and mysterious. So that understanding of what's taken place is going to be amazing as we recognize that God is powerful and God is mysterious. So our theme this morning is this, is that the Lord is wise and powerful. And as He reveals His mystery, Mysteries, may we worship him. Very simple. And, and as we respond to his power and his work in our lives, it has to come as worship. You see, we see in this, this, this chapter, we'll see this picture of this weak and powerless king who lacked wisdom and understanding. But by the world's standards, Nebuchadnezzar was considered to be wise and powerful. So we see in this encounter that God demonstrates his power and wisdom to a man who desired power and wisdom for himself. But since God is, is the source of all wisdom and power, he had to turn to him. And we have to turn to him if we desire that, that understanding of God's mystery and power. But as we see in chapter 2, we'll discover that there is a problem. And as, as prayer and praise are our response and, and how, this we, how we're led by it. So let's look at the very beginning. We're going to be, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of verses 1 to 16. It's uh, interpreting the problem here. So the problem is this, is that as we get to the place of understanding, there's, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, <coughs> excuse me, and he's troubled by it to the point to where he can't sleep. And so he has this, this dream, he wakes up in this cold sweat, right? And so he gets to this place where I need to understand what this is. So he goes and he calls all the magicians, the, the, uh, the enchanters, and, and all these different people and says, I want you to tell me what this dream means. And so the astrologers get to the place and they say, well, we'll tell you what it means as soon as you tell us what it was. And so King Nebuchadnezzar does something really interesting here. His response is, no, I'm not going to tell you what it was. You're going to tell me what that dream was. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you and every single wise person in Babylon. Okay. There's a problem. Right? There's a problem. These astrologers get to the place where they ask and tell the king the dream. We'll interpret it. But, but king, the king demanded that. And he says, that looking for proof of how disturbed he was. He wanted to know so desperately that he says, not only do I want you to tell me what it means, but you need to tell me what I dreamt. He was puzzled. He was desperate in wanting to know what that truly was. And we see in verse 10, the astrologers answered the king. They said, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No one on earth who can do what the king asked. That is the one thing that they said was 100% true. No man on planet earth can do with what they've asked. But God can do it through a man who's willing. You see, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, it says, For who knows... A person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. 
What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. You see, the wise men of Babylon, didn't, they didn't have the Spirit of God living in them, so they could not know what the dream meant, nor its interpretation. It's not possible. This made the king so angry that he ordered the execution of all the wise men. So the wise men came back and they said, no, we can't do this. He says, fine. He tells the, the, the commander of, of the king of Babylon, he, said, he tells the, the commander to, of these men, he says, I want you to execute every single one of them. And so the commander goes, and he goes to execute them. And as the commander of the king's guard went out to, to execute the wise men, put him to death, he gets to Daniel. And when Daniel was told that what he was being executed for, he responds with wisdom and with tact. Wisdom and tact. His response was this. He responded with difficult clarity in the midst of wisdom because he was a true wise man. Look at what he says in verse 15. He asks about the urgency of the king. You see, only a wise person would hear that they're getting ready to be put to death. And he says, I want you, you're going to be put to death because no one can tell me what that dream is nor what it means. And his response is, why do you want to know so bad? He was truly trying to understand what was taking place. And as he responds of this problem, he responds then by asking for more time. He says, no, why don't you give me more time so that we can have more time to try to interpret what this is? You see, there was a problem and Daniel immediately recognized that he needed time to approach God. You see, often we may, might be put into difficult circumstances in our life, and we might be taken back and saying, all right, you need to figure out what this is right here, right now, or you're going to die. That's what this experience was. Daniel says, give me more time so that I can figure out what's going on. You see, when it comes to the response of incoming problems, we must respond with clarity and wisdom, trusting that God through it all and rejoicing for the opportunity. See, here's the picture. Because if you really go to the heart of Daniel, his response was, oh, I'm going, it wasn't going to say, oh, I'm going to tell you what it means. His response was, God, you have an opportunity to do something amazing. So God, if you choose to use me to go about and do it, so be it. But if not, that's okay. Whew. No matter what the problem is, we need to trust God through it all. Secondly, as we look to the second point we're looking at this morning is that prayer leads to praise. Because at this next, this next instance of what takes place with Daniel, Daniel is saying to him, he says in verse 17, it says, Then Daniel returned to the house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plea for mercy for the king, or for the God of heaven concerned this mystery so that he and his friends might be executed, might not be executed with the rest of the men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Notice how his response for asking more time wasn't because he knew what the answer was. Daniel's response to ask for more time was that he could see God work through it. And when he sought God in prayer in the midst of what was taking place, God gave him the answers to the vision. Powerful. You see, Daniel knew exactly that he didn't have to do this alone, nor could he do this alone. He went back to the house where his three friends, and they were making a way for a miracle to take place. When you and I get to the place where we plead to God and seek his face above all things, we're giving him an opportunity for a miracle to take place because miracles cannot be defined by ourselves. They can only be exclaimed by God. Daniel was saying, no, I can't do this on my own. But God, you can do this through me. So if that be according to your will, go, please do it. And God chose to do so. I think possibly the reason that we don't pray faithfully or fervently enough is because we don't feel the urgency for opportunities for God to do a mighty work that can only be exclaimed by Him. 
can only be explained by Him. We tend to be self-reliant and do not see our need to be big, our God to be big enough. Of course, we'd never say that, but our actions show that. And that's why the testimony of what we say God can do needs to be clear. Prayer leads to praise. This prayer leads us to depend, which is in turn brings about praise. Look at verse 19 tells us that God revealed the vision to Daniel. You see, we have a great God who hears and answers prayer. I don't know about you, but I've experienced that, and I know that in my life. That's why we, we have a tendency to go to God in prayer, because I've seen it work. And if you've seen it work, why don't we go back for more opportunity to see Him work through prayer? God answers prayer. In the second part of verse 19, it says, Then Daniel praised the God of heaven, and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. See, at that moment, when Daniel received that vision, he immediately went and he praised God. And he praised God for three things specifically as he's praying. You see, many, many rulers and, and, and leaders in this world have a lot of power, but they lack wisdom. And they can be very dangerous because their power cannot be kept in line through wisdom. That can be a dangerous, dangerous thing. But we see in Daniel, he praises God first off for the power of God in verse 21. It says this, he changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. You see, Daniel learned that... that from what was the dream about, the Lord revealed it to him. He revealed to him the four kings that would rise to power only to be overthrown in time. And these words were spoken before Daniel in Isaiah 40. Again, Daniel's a wise man. Why? Because he goes and he sees this interpretation. He immediately goes to God's word and he sees Isaiah 40 that had been written just a couple hundred years before Daniel himself. And he says, this is what I need. This this is the truth by which God is doing a mighty work. You see, as Christians, we need to remember that the power of God over the rulers of this world at times, especially when it comes to national elections. Many Christians seem to be frustrated if a leader is elected that is contrary to Christian principles. Though it might be disappointing, we must remember that the Lord tells us that all authority is God's. And those that exist have been instituted by him. Ouch. Ouch. That's Romans 13. That's not my opinion. That's the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, I urge you then, first of all, as petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving... Be made for all people, for kings and for all those in authority, that we have made peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and wisdom and holiness. You see, the picture here, too, is this. Is, I know we've been talking about this in men's Bible study on, on Wednesday nights. Is It's hard to pray for a leader that you don't agree with. But it must be done because it's the, God, it's the one that God's put in place. So we need to be praying just as Tom prayed this morning. That we have the perspective of God's through the midst of even the differences that we have of opinions. Even if it goes against God's word. We, we won't like it. And we're not called to like it. But we're called to pray for him. So may we do so. God is powerful and the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of God and he turns it wherever he will. That's Proverbs chapter 21. Praise God for his power. Secondly, Daniel prays and, and praises God for the wisdom of God. In verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and the light dwells in him. You see, secondly, Daniel praised God for being all-knowing. He praised him because he knows the hidden things, such as the thoughts of men, which can be kept from other men. I love in Psalms, 
uh, chapter 139, verses 1 to 4, and then verse 6, it says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. <laughs> this perspective for me is incredibly humbling and satisfying all in the same breath. Because imagine this. Imagine recognizing that God is all-knowing. First, that's humbling. Why? Because he knows my thoughts and they are not always good. He knows my thoughts and they are not always pure. It's satisfying because he knows my thoughts and they're not always good, yet he loves me unconditionally. Praise God for his wisdom and his love for us. The third thing we see that Daniel praises God for is for the revelation of God. Mm. You see, revelation is God making his thoughts known to man. So, the book of Revelation God's thoughts being made known to men. What's going to happen? What the future holds? You see, our reminder is, is that no one can comprehend the thoughts of God except for, from the Spirit. The Spirit is the vehicle of revelation. You, we're not going to know what God's Word says unless the Holy Spirit indwells us. Now, remember that. Remember that for those that do not know the Lord. They cannot be obedient to the Lord if they don't know Him. And if they don't have the Spirit, they're not going to have the revelation from God that you and I have. Don't hold that against them. Pray for them. Seek them out in prayer. John 16, verses 12 to 14, is I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me, because it is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. You see, this is true, and it's something that is very important for us to know as we approach the Bible. As, as the Bible is the infallible thoughts of God revealed to sinful men so that we may know all that we need to know about God, His salvation, and the future of this world. It's important that we know these things. If we really believe this, we will want to know the Bible as well, and He will provide a way for revelation in our lives when we desire His Word and as we study it. It must be a part of our everyday life. Prayer leads to praise, and that's important for us to understand. So as Daniel gets from, in chapter 2, verse 24, as Daniel gets to this place, he's appoints this, uh, the, is appointed to be executed. He says, uh, please don't execute me, uh, don't execute not just me, but all the wise men of Babylon, and take me to the king, because I want to interpret the dream. And so the king asked Nebuchadnezzar, who is also known as Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what, what I've seen and what it means? Daniel replies, this is, this is my favorite part. Yes, I have lots of favorites, but this is definitely one of them. Daniel replies in verse 27, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. Like he could have stopped right there and then he would have been killed. No man can do this. He says, but there's a but. But there is a God in heaven who is the revealer of mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your vision and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. You see, because the revealer of mysteries, Daniel was able to do the impossible. You see, you and I, when we seek the Lord in all wisdom, desiring His work, His will, His way, we have opportunities to do the very thing that Daniel has been called to do and is yet to do. 
We have this opportunity, and it's not us, it's all him. So again, as Daniel recognizes this, Daniel's not looking for any of this glory, and we'll look through that as, as we look through the rest of chapter 2, but Daniel's not looking for any credit here. He's like, no, deflect. This is not me. This is all him. So if you are thankful for what's taking place, just be thankful to him. First way that Daniel says this is this way. To stand in awe. Wow. Wow. We sang about that this morning. What, a, what an incredible, incredible word to stand in awe. As we see here in verses 29 to 35, Daniel proceeds to tell the king his dream. And, and I'm sure the king was awestruck to hear the secret of the thoughts of his mind revealed. Again, no human could do this without God's help. Again, as Daniel's getting ready to do this, just imagine the recipient of being the one who was given the dream. Not telling a soul what you dreamt, and someone telling you not only what you dreamt, but also what it meant. That's what King Nebuchadnezzar was getting ready to walk through. You see, we see the mysteries revealed now, but imagine at time when Jesus saw the boy brought down from the, earth, from the roof. Remember that? When these men so desired this young man, to, this crippled young man to be, come to Jesus, they, they cut a hole in the roof and they, they lower him down to Jesus. But I want us to remember Jesus' response when that man was lowered down and put right in front of, right in front of Jesus in Mark chapter 2, verses 8 to 5. It says, Now, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> that wasn't the reason they came. But that's what Jesus knew what needed to be done. Verse 6, now some teachers of the law sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, <laughs> again, I, I just love anything that has to do with Jesus. Jesus knew in his spirit that this, what was, they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Again, just imagine, again, just as Nebuchadnezzar was being told these words, what he just dreamt and what it meant, the same thing was these religious leaders that are hearing Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, and they're getting ready to watch his Legs be healed and this crippled man to be healed. Are you in awe of the revealer of mysteries? Are you in awe of who he is? What he's done? Give him glory that is due his name. Starting in verse 31, we see here, I'm just going to read verse 31 to 35 here. We see the statue that's described and then the statue that is destroyed. Your majesty, look, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance, and the, bra the head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs, and its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet, of iron and clay and smashed them. The clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces, became like chaff on the threshing floor. In the summer, the wind swept through them, swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. You see, all magicians, enchanters, all these sorcerers, they're not able to tell the answer of what the Lord's, of what the, the king's dream was. They were afraid for their lives, but Daniel revealed what the dream said, and he was amazed that every detail had been so accurate. Nebuchadnezzar was so amazed, and he did not object to one thing that Daniel described. So let's stand in awe of the revelation of what God did 
with through Daniel and through this dream. And the second part that comes along with this is this, is that we are to sit and to ponder. So as we stand in awe, we come to this place of sitting and pondering. Pondering what has taken place here. As we look at verses 36 to 35. Now Daniel is getting ready to tell him what the interpretation of the dream was. Again, remembering Daniel didn't want any credit for this for himself. He continued to say that he wanted to interpret it. But when Nebuchadnezzar heard the description he described, he desired to hear the interpretation. Again, you and I, if we heard someone tell me a dream that I dreamt without me telling them what I dreamt, I'm going to know what it, mean, what it means. Especially if they've told me they have that ability, I'm going to want to know as well. And he starts off by saying the four parts of the statue represent the four consecutive kingdoms, beginning with the kingdom of Babylon over which Nebuchadnezzar was the rule. And the head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar. So in verse 37, we see this. The statue looks like a man. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. And the God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air. Wherever you live, he has made you ruler over all of them. You are the head of gold. So that had to feel good for Nebuchadnezzar at the very beginning, right? You're the most expensive piece of gold. This is what you are. This is what you look like. So you're the head. Nebuchadnezzar, again, selfish, prideful person, unwise, says, great, I'm so, I'm, I'm so happy about this, right? But what we recognize, too, is that, is that Nebuchadnezzar, yes, he had the power, the might, and the glory, but the revelation that was getting ready to take place was getting ready to humble him in his place of leadership. He did not know this at the time. But there, see, you see, any person's that, that's power is revealed that, that, again, this picture of God has given you this power. So someone who is once all the power and all the glory, they're going to say, no, 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 I'm king. I'm in control. This is my world, and it's going to go my way. Daniel just said, no, this world is created by God, and he's put you in power. So then Nebuchadnezzar is like, whoa, that's going to be a place of humility. Especially with what takes place later on, right? Daniel mentions in one verse the kings, uh, the, the two kingdoms were Persia and, and, and Greece. We know this in, as we look to the history, as we look to it, and we'll explain each, each way of how this looks in verse 39. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours, next a third kingdom, one of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Verse 40, finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks pieces, uh, things into pieces, so will it crush through and break all the others. Just as you saw the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and iron, partly of iron, so that will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with the bay clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. So if we go, again, if we dive into history following Daniel, we can see that these things came true. Yes, prophecy that came in Daniel came true. Rome was captured and burnt by the Gauls under the leadership of Brennus in 390 BC, but it was temporary. Soon the Roman army began military fronts and would be eventually establish a world empire like the pieces, the iron pieces in verse 40. 
You see, in the series, there were three wars existing from 340 to 290 BC, and the Romans gained control of central Italy. And Rome became the mightiest state in the east as they conquered the king of Macedonia between 200 and 197 BC. All of this taking place during the three Punic Wars, ending in 146 BC. Amazing. Amazing. All of these things Daniel said were going to come true came true. During the time right before the King of Kings came to planet Earth. You see, we hear and we see this clear prophecy of these four kingdoms. It amazes me that even some scholars claim that it would not be Daniel's prediction that the Messiah would be the one born during the Roman Empire. But Daniel, he could have explained this entire message by saying, God's sovereign. And I think you and I need to know this. We need to know this this morning more than we need to know this anything else. God is sovereign, which means he has this in his control and nothing happens outside of it. That's, that gives us hope, y'all. That gives us hope with, in response. Well, hopefully it leads us to faithfulness. Faithfulness in following what he desires us to do. We can take this, and it's not the prophecy is meaningless, or it's something that needs to be, in general, it's something that has taken place, and it is truth. You see, we see in verses 44 and 45, this, this picture that God tells Daniel in the kingdom of God, uh, what was it going to be on earth? It says, a rock cut out from a mountain is not by human hands. You see, this kingdom will be set up and never be destroyed. Whew. That's Jesus, okay? That's Jesus. God's timetable does not always look like ours, but it would be not be for another 140 years until Jesus actually came, that this became true. But Daniel says that the stone will start small, and it begins in verse, as he says, it begins in verse 35. But the object that has struck the statue was a rock. It wasn't a huge mountain yet. It was something very small, but had the ability to knock down any nation, had the ability to rock anything that was in its place. Because any idol that gets in the form of where God's kingdom needs to be is going to get rocked down. Amen. And when it gets rocked down, now that little stone turns into a huge mountain and will never be destroyed. And that's the mountain by which we stand in the kingdom of God that started when he eventually established it in just 140 years later after all of these other things came true. You see, the Romans... They understood that their, uh, they didn't understand at the time, but their time would come to an end. And one day in the future, the kingdom of the whole earth will be where Jesus reigns upon the earth as king. We see this in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. It says, On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. You will flee from my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azil. You will flee as you fled from an earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, when the, king, uh, when the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. And I love what if you go down a little bit further in verse 9, it says this. It says, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. That picture of what takes place of all of this coming true. I know this is a lot to swallow, a lot to absorb this morning, but I want us to understand this, that the kingdom of God is now is the rule of Christ in our hearts. When it says that the kingdom is going to come down, yes, it's talking about it's going to come down to in the people of God. You see, his kingdom rule is what reigns in our hearts, in our lives. So the question is, what in our life needs to get rocked and needs to get crumbled down so that he can have his rightful place in us? 
So as we sit and ponder and wonder these mysteries and the miracle that comes about in Christianity, Christ has come and He wants to dwell among His people. And He chooses to do that in and through us. And the last part we see in chapter 2 is the, the final third in chapter 2, verses 46 to 49. We see in verse 47 that God gets exalted here. Because immediately, again, this is, again, this is my second favorite part. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered an offering and incense be presented to him. All right, so first... <laughs> It's, again, you and I, if, if someone came and told us this dream that we didn't tell anything about, and someone came and told us what it was and what it meant, and you knew it, you would fall flat on your face. I, I know I would. I know I would. But see, King Nebuchadnezzar started worshiping Daniel rather than God. So his object of worship was off, but not for long. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Okay, so as he's getting and giving this offering to Daniel, again, imagine this. He's giving this, this to a person that just was used by the, the amazing revealer of mysteries. So he's going to worship the one to whom God chose to use. Not realizing that he should have just worshipped the one who gave him the ability to do this. You see, we can see this in our own culture, in our own world. We can worship the wrong things. We see someone, a great sermon or something like that, and we start thinking, boy, that guy, that's, that's pretty straight. And then when that person fails and falls, then, we, then it, 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 unfortunately it starts affecting our own walk because, oh, well, that person I loved hearing their sermons, and yet here they go, and he was an apologist, and he did all these terrible things. You see, maybe, maybe we're worshiping the created rather than the creator, and we have to be careful on that. Our praise needs to be God and God alone. We should rejoice that Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged and exalted kings, the, Daniel's king. Yet he wouldn't do it for very long. We'll see that in, in, our, next, in our next chapter next week. But in verses 48 to 49, we see his friends promoted. And there's something very cool about this. I'll just read it for you. It says, When the king placed Daniel in the high position, lavished him with gifts on him, he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, Daniel's request to the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. What's cool here is that Daniel and his friends were now promoted to be the chief wise men over all of these men. And not only did, did he, you know, Daniel didn't say, okay, well, these guys didn't worship the real God, so take them out, you know, because they don't worship the real God. Daniel saw as an opportunity as in their promotion to do great work in and through them. And this is what's cool about this. Those men... Because at this moment, those men were the ones that, they started learning from Daniel. They saw that testimony, they saw what was taking place in his own life, and they started seeing that that was real. So much so, that you know that descendants of the ones that Daniel trained were the magi that searched for the star to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't tell me our testimony doesn't matter. Because the testimony by which that God has called each of us to, to be used is the one that could affect someone else's life and could become for years and years to come. As we apply this to our life this morning, I want us to remember three things is this, is to rejoice, bow down, and worship. As we rejoice, rejoice what Christ has done. You see, God has worked through Christ to bring about salvation to those who believe. He continues to work mysteriously in ways that we cannot see it. So whether it be making a list and you, you put it on your, in your fridge when you see the blessings of God, whether it be a jar and you put a little piece of paper and you fold it up and you put it in there, and when, and when that jar fills up with blessings of God, then you take them all out and you read them and you see how God works. Rejoice for what God has done. 
Secondly, repent from our evil ways. This is vital. This is vital. You see, you and I cannot take any step forward in our relationship with God if we're not willing to repent from our evil ways. We must, that is, turning from them and walking, facing God. Pursuing Him, we must repent from our evil ways. Whatever it gonna, is going to take, may we, knock, may we allow the rock to knock down the feet of what stands in the place of God in our own life. And thirdly, worship the God with right living according to His Word. Again, right living, this is right living is in the worship of right living. It's not, it's not so that we can get any kind of credit. Just remember Daniel. He didn't want any credit for what God chose to do in and through him. But as we study God's Word, may we allow that right living as He speaks to us. May we surrender our time and our efforts and be used by Him as we look to His Word and allow His Word to change every aspect of who we are. Let's remember our theme this morning is this, that the Lord is wise and powerful. And as He reveals His mysteries, may we worship Him. But finally, we can rejoice when we bow down. We will worship. Let's pray.